Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you for inviting me. And the subject of my talk is advances in the computation of NMR interaction parameters in materials. So, here we are. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about three topics today. Uh, the first will be NMR crystallography using quadrupolar nuclei with a focus on the construction of dispersion corrected force fields for accurately refining structures of organic materials. And there will also be applications to pharmaceuticals and an examination of the importance of molecular level dynamics on observed NMR parameters. In the second topic, I'll be discussing uh, some recent work we've been doing on the platinum group elements, including a survey of computational methods applied to platinum and ligand atoms, and, and some new exciting work on rhodium-103. And finally, I want to briefly mention the idea of constructing a database of accurate chemical shift tensors. So for the first uh, subject, I'd like to start by introducing the subject of NMR crystallography, which refers broadly to uh, any application in which NMR solid state NMR parameters provide a key piece of information for interpreting the structure of a material. But in particular here, I'm using it in the context of the combination of solid state NMR methods, some sort of X-ray diffraction, uh, whether it be single crystal or powder, and DFT calculations, with the hope that the combination of these three techniques can provide more, more details than any method individually. We'll be focusing on solid state NMR using quadrupolar nuclei. So a quadrupolar nuclei is any nucleus with a spin greater than three halves. So th these nuclei have a, a quadrupole moment and that quadrupole moment interacts with the electric field gradient at the nucleus. And in the NMR spectrum, it appears at in this case as a central transition powder pattern that is influenced by the second order quadrupolar interaction. Interestingly, analysis of these materials have the potential of providing a lot of information. This includes the electric field gradient tensor, the magnetic shielding tensor, as well as the set of Euler angles uh, relating the relative orientations of these tensors. But significantly, having access to both the electric field gradient and magnetic shielding tensor is a very powerful uh, set very a powerful set of information because these two interactions have independent and distinct physical origins. One nucleus we're very interested in is chlorine 35, and that's because it is an extremely sensitive gauge of local structure, and it occurs in a very large number of pharmaceuticals. So for example, approximately half of oral dosage forms of pharmaceuticals contain chloride ions. And the reason chloride ions are such a, a powerful probe of local structure is because the chloride ions interact by hydrogen bonds with nearby organic moieties. And the distribution of the, of the structure around the chlorine ion, meaning the types of hydrogen bond donating, donating moieties, their distances from the chlorine ion, and their spatial arrangement with respect to one another, greatly influence the way these patterns look, giving uh, you an excellent source of fingerprinting different solid forms, uh, identifying new solid forms, and even uh, the ability to predict structures in some cases. As an example of this, uh, we can look at the uh, pharmaceutical xylazine hydrochloride, which is uh, a veterinary sedative. And we looked at four different uh, polymorphs or pseudopolymorphs of this drug, as you can see here. So we see we have a hydrate and then three anhydrous polymorphs, and each one gives a unique spectral fingerprint, none of which can be mistaken for the other. And this is because each solid form features a distinct arrangement of hydrogen bonds around the chlorine atom. Now, our goal is to use plane wave DFT in order to calculate these chlorine EFG tensors in order to relate them to molecular level structure. So let's take the example of a common hydrochloride salt, which is histidine hydrochloride monohydrate. This is the crystal uh, an example of a crystal structure showing that around the chloride ion, there are three hydrogen bonds, two with charged amine groups, one with a water molecule. And experimentally, uh, from chlorine NMR, we know the CQ and the eta Q of this site, which describe the EFG tensor. Now you can enter the Cambridge database and look up different structures that have been determined for histidine hydrochloride monohydrate using different radiation types, uh, namely um, X-rays and neutrons and uh, data that have been acquired at different temperatures. 
And if you look, there is a distribution in the structural features, specifically these hydrogen bonding distances. And if you simply take these structures with no geometry optimization, you can calculate the EFG tensors. And you can see in every case, the numbers are quite different from one another, and none of them agree well with experiment. And this highlights the sensitivity of, of these calculations of, of these parameters to structural refinement or the choice of structure you feed into your calculation. Let's take the example of a pharmaceutical called cementidine hydrochloride uh, monohydrate. And we see an experimental uh, uh, powder pattern for, for chlorine uh, acquired at 21.1 Tesla. In black is the experimental pattern. In red is a simulation used to extract the EFG and chemical shift tensors. You can then uh, take the crystal structure of this material and perform a plane wave DFT geometry optimization and calculate the magnetic shielding and EFG tensor parameters. And if you simulate it, you get a pattern that looks like this, which is obviously not a good match. In fact, the value of CQ is overestimated by over one megahertz. So clearly something is wrong in these uh, standard geometry optimizations. And the first thing we posited was, was that this is simply because these calculations lack proper dispersion corrections, which seem to be essential for describing the positions of hydrogen atoms participating in chlorine uh, in hydrogen bonds involving a chlorine atom. So we had uh, addressed this problem through use of so-called DFT-D methods, which are semi-empirical dispersion corrections in which a simple term is added to the cone sham energy in order to correct for these otherwise absent interactions. And the way you can visualize how this works is through the example of a layered solid like hexagonal boron nitride, where the, the main structural parameter that you can vary in a calculation is the distance between the adjacent layers of the material. And if you run a calculation uh, with no dispersion correction whatsoever, as in a standard DFT approximation, you will end up with this blue curve in which you'll see there is no distance in which the energy between the two layers is minimized. However, if you introduce some sort of dispersion interaction, you'll find an energy minimum, and it corresponds very well to the experimental uh, interlayer distance. We have, however, decided to take an alternate approach to designing these dispersion corrections, and this is through reparameterizing standard approximations in the literature through a training set involving calculations of EFG tensors on a variety of organic solids. So this training set consists of uh, uh, 15 nitrogen-14 EFG tensors, 25 oxygen EFG tensors, and 10 chlorine EFG tensors. And, after, and following the parameterization of some standard force field models, this is then applied to a much larger test set consisting of uh, well over 100 systems. In these reparameterizations, we found that the most sensitive value, uh, sorry, the most sensitive sensitive parameter is the so-called damping parameter. And in a, in a series of geometry optimizations, one can simply change the value of this damping parameter between the two and a half up to an arbitrarily high number, perform the geometry optimization, get out a resulting structure, which are all subtly different from one another and then calculate the EFG tensors and compare with experiment. And once you do that, you find that the best agreement with experiment is found universally when the damping parameter is set to around three and a half for EFG tensors. And so this uh, approximation leads us to these new force fields, which we call uh, D2 star or TS star, referring to the reparameterized version of these standard approximations that are currently, that are currently in the literature. So returning to the example of cementidine hydrochloride monohydrate, you can see using the standard DFT approximation without this new dispersion interaction, we get a very large overestimation of the value of CQ. However, if we perform this new geometry optimization and calculate the EFGs for this new structure, we end up with this resulting pattern, which as you can see is a much closer uh, representation of the experimental pattern. And indeed, we find that the value of CQ here is now 3.9 megahertz, which is in close agreement with the experimental value of 4.1 megahertz. Now, this was then applied to a very large test set consisting of well over 100 molecules. And we see in these plots 
on the x-axis, we have the experimental uh, EFG tensor parameters, or so, uh, the pr experimental principal values of the EFG tensors displayed in atomic units. And on the y-axis, we have the calculated values in atomic units. The three panels show first in orange, uh, just the standard DFT approximation, not employing any dispersion model whatsoever. And we quantify the agreement between calculation and experiment using a term called the EFG distance. The closer this number is to zero, the better in agreement the, the calculation is with experiment. And in this case, we see that the EFG distance is 0 0.051 atomic units. Moving down to the blue panel, where we introduce a standard dispersion model before we re-optimized it, uh, we, we find that the EFG distance is very much comparable to that in the case to the previous case in which no dispersion correction was introduced whatsoever. However, in yellow, we see this new uh, parameterization based on uh, EFG tensors. And we find that the EFG distance has dropped to 0 0.036 atomic units. So this is a substantial improvement in the accuracy of these calculations. And it gives us confidence that we are uh, producing more reliable crystal structures. You can see this uh, for each individual type of atom, because remember, we're looking at a combination of oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. Again, the, these bar graphs uh, give the accuracy for each set. So we see for first for X-ray diffraction, standard DFT approximation. Uh, the next two would be the standard dispersion model before we optimized it. And the final two would be the optimized dispersion models. And you can see the, these error bars are always substantially small, uh, smaller in the case of these optimized models. But interestingly, there are examples of hydrochloride salts in the Cambridge database in which the crystal structures have been obtained through neutron diffraction. And these have also been studied through chlorine NMR. And because neutron diffraction is generally considered the, quote, gold standard for structure determination, we can simply take the, these neutron diffraction models and calculate the EFG tensors without any type of geometry optimization and see if these give closer approximations to the experimental EFG tensors than these newly refined structures, which we see here for uh, six examples of hydrochloride salts. The gray bar in every case indicates neutron diffraction. In one case, uh, uh, for lysine, there are actually two examples in the Cambridge database of structures obtained by neutron diffraction. And we see that in every case, these newly refined structures actually outperform neutron diffraction. Now, as one interesting application, uh, we're going to look at a case in which chlorine NMR tells us far more information than we can get from a single crystal X-ray diffraction alone. And this is through looking at a series of multi-component crystals that consist of urea and some ammonium chloride salt. So we were able to synthesize these four materials that you see on screen, uh, consisting of uh, tetraethyl, uh, yeah, uh, and NET4Cl, two ureas, uh, the same thing, but with water, and then with the propyl versions. And we characterized these through chlorine NMR at multiple fields. And from this, we were able to obtain the EFG and chemical shift tensors. And in each of these four cases, the agreement between calculation and experiment was excellent. However, we, we started running into problems when we looked at the case of NH4Cl urea, which contains two different chlorine sites. And we found that simply optimizing the, the crystal structure, the atomic coordinates, and calculating the EFG tensors, we found there were huge misses with experiment. In fact, we were overestimating the value of CQ for one of the two sites by nearly two megahertz. And we, our first guess uh, was that because this material contains NH4 cations, it's possible that the molecular level motions of these groups influence uh, the, the uh, uh, EFG that appeared, that manifests in the chlorine spectra. So we were able to acquire these chlorine spectra at a series of temperatures. And we find that for one of the sites, as you decrease the temperature, the value of CQ goes up, which you can see in these uh, simulations on the bottom, uh, comparing the, the green pattern on the top, which was acquired at minus 125 C with the narrower pattern on the bottom, which was acquired at 25C. 
So there is a way in the, uh, to, to account for molecular level motions within your DFT simulations, and that is to run an ab initio molecular dynamic simulation in which you allow the, you input some amount of kinetic energy into your system and you allow the atoms to move uh, over, the, over the course of picoseconds uh, with, with snapshots to acquire every half a femtosecond or thereabouts. And through this MD run, you, you are able to take a series of snapshots, usually several hundred of them, and calculate the EFG tensors for each of those and then average them, and this will give you a time-averaged EFG tensor. And as we can see on the screen, uh, we can compare the so-called static model with this dynamic model, and we see for that the second chlorine atom in particular, we get a much closer agreement with the experimental value when we average over all these multiple all these structures generated through our MD runs. And with that, I'd like to switch to the second topic, which is applications to the platinum group elements. So the platinum group elements include ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, and platinum. And these have uh, innumerable applications, including to uh, anti-cancer drugs, other medical applications such as dental alloys, uh, light-emitting materials, optically active compounds, vaporchromic moisture sensors, and especially to catalysis. The problem with, with these materials is that they are extremely rare, or rare and costly. In particular, rhodium is the most expensive metal in the world. Uh, it's, this is very unfortunate because these materials have all sorts of critical applications, especially to catalysis, as I mentioned. Now, the reason the platinum group elements are important is because of their unique uh, covalent donation bonding or date of bonding within coordination compounds. By date of bonding, we simply mean that electrons are donated from the ligands into the metal. And it's this particular unique date of bonding associated with the platinum group elements that makes them so useful in these applications. And so the goals of, of this research are to use the combination of solid state NMR spectroscopy and computational methods in order to understand the nature of this bonding. And ultimately, if we, we can learn, uh, learn something useful, we can potentially use dip, uh, combinations of other transition metals and ligands in order to produce uh, advanced materials that have similar properties and can be therefore replace the rare and costly uh, platinum group elements in applications. So I'm going to start with an overview of some important things you need to consider when calculating magnetic shielding tensors or potentially EFG tensors for materials containing heavy atoms. And there are three critical considerations. The first of which is when you can when your material contains a heavy atom such as platinum, rhodium, et cetera, you have to include relativistic effects. And usually this has to be done at the spin orbit level. Second, you have to account for intermolecular effects, meaning the atoms within different molecules can interact with each other, and this sometimes has very large impacts on your predicted magnetic shielding tensor. Thirdly, you need to consider the type of DFT approximation you're using, specifically the type of functional. You, you have the pure DFT methods, such as the GGA approximation. You also have so-called hybrid models. And of course, with, with all of the, these uh, considerations comes the increase in computational cost as the calculations become more advanced. For dealing with solids in particular, there are two different uh, methods available to you. You have periodic calculations. Uh, these would be performed using, uh, for example, um, CASTEP. And for the uh, prediction of magnetic shielding tensors, this generally uses the GPAW approach. Uh, your basis is made up of plane waves, and you use pseudopotentials to uh, model core valence interactions. Unfortunately, you are limited in several aspects. Uh, this includes the use of pure DFT functionals such as um, LDAs, GGAs, and meta-GGAs, and you're limited in the type of relativistic approximation you can use, in particular to the scalar level. Uh, however, as, as we saw earlier, these methods have um, all sorts of 
of benefits when, calc when uh, performing calculations on the, these um, organic solids. So this is not to uh, dismiss uh, GPA in any way. Now, when, uh, the other uh, method available to us is to run calculations using clusters of molecules to represent the solid state. And you can do this in a software package such, such as ADF. Uh, the methodology for predi uh, predicting the magnetic shield and tensor is through the gauge including atomic orbital method. And here we're using a Slater type orbitals rather than uh, plane waves, an all electron basis rather than a pseudopotential basis. And it significantly, uh, we have access to really any type of functional we so choose. And we can um, use relativistic approximations up to the spin orbit level. Of course, this all comes at a computational cost, but these can be examined on a system by system basis to, this basis to see if that cost is necessary to achieve the best agreement with the experiment. Another thing you have to consider is the difference between a molecular solid and a network solid. So in the case of a molecular solid, you can simply construct a cluster consisting of one molecule in the center and however many neighboring molecules in its vicinity you need in order to um, account for any type of hydrogen bonding or metal-metal interaction that happens to be in your system. The trickier case is with a network solid, where the material in the solid state consists of an infinite network of covalent bonds, and you have to introduce some approximations in order to build a cluster and be able to achieve SCF convergence so that you can get meaningful magnetic shielding or EFG tensors out of your calculation. So this is one method that we've used uh, to account uh, in order to achieve SCF convergence on a so-called network solid. So this is the example of K2PTCl4. And we start with one central atom and we expand the cluster around it up to the third coordination shell. Now this leads to atoms on the periphery of the cluster that are missing their, their um, covalent bonds with the neighbors that should be there in the solid state. So as a result, the, these clusters have very large charges. And if you try to perform any type of calculation, you will fail to achieve meaningful SCF convergence. So one way to account for this is to examine each of these peripheral atoms individually and determine how many bonds they're missing and, and modify the nuclear charge to account for that. So for example, in this particular solid, you'll see that there are two different types of peripheral chlorine atoms, uh, each of which is missing a different number of bonds because it is truncated the, uh, to form this cluster model. And the way we account for this is depending on how many bonds are missing, you can increase the nuclear charge by a value to account for that. So in this case, we can increase the standard nuclear charges from 17 to 17.7 or 17.93, depending on the number of missing atoms. And the result of this is that if you uh, try to run any type of DFT calculation, you will now be able to achieve meaningful SCF convergence, as we can see in this blue line, as opposed to uh, the red line, which shows that you never achieve convergence when you, do, when you do not introduce these modified nuclear charges. Uh, this uh, approximation has been successful in numerous applications involving light atoms. So in the, you'll see several of these plots today. On the x-axis, we see the experimental uh, principal components of the chemical shift tensor. And on the y-axis, we see the calculated principal components of the magnetic shielding tensor. Ideally, the, these should be correlated such that they have a slope of minus one. And we see three different sets of data here for calculations of phosphorus chemical shifts for a series of phosphates silicon chemical shifts for a series of silicates, and uh, uh, fluorine chemical shifts for a series of metal fluorides. And in each case, we can get very good agreement with the experiment, and in, in general, better agreement than is possible with GPOP because we can um, employ more advanced functionals or relativistic treatments, depending on which is necessary for the particular set of systems. Now, moving on to calculations involving the actual platinum group elements. Uh, here we see the experimental uh, uh, platinum-195 spectra for cisplatin and transplatin. And I've chosen platinum as a starting point here because of all of, of the platinum group elements 
platinum is is itself the one that is the most explored. So there there are dozens of examples in the literature of platinum chemical shift tensors, and this affords us the opportunity to benchmark the accuracy of our DFT calculations. So we see the, the spans of these materials are quite large, around 9,000 ppm for both cisplatin and transplatin. You can then um, uh, obtain structural models from the Cambridge database, subject them to a plane wave DFT geometry optimization, and then build clusters of increasing size in order to see what size of cluster is necessary to achieve the best agreement with experiment. And as you can see here, as you go from an isolated molecule to a cluster that contain that consists of only the nearest neighbors to a cluster that consists of the entire first coordination shell around that molecule, the, you'll see that the span increases each time. However, beyond this point, the span does not increase. So this shows that in the case of the, these uh, square planar platinum complexes, intermolecular effects are very large. So you need to uh, introduce a large uh, cluster to account for all these interactions, and that comes at a very great computational cost. Examining this in a little bit more detail, uh, the structures of, of cisplatin and transplatin are quite different in the solid state. So in the case of cisplatin, the molecules pack such that there are interactions between the, the platinum sites in adjacent atoms. And in this plot, we see uh, how each individual principal component changes as we increase the size of the cluster, going from an isolated molecule up to a full cluster consisting of 15 molecules. And we see that it is actually sigma 1, 1 unique principal component, which is most strongly impacted by intermolecular effects. Now, in contrast, transplatin packs in the solid state such that there are, there are not metal-metal interactions. Instead, the metal center of one uh, molecule interacts with the ligand atoms of the adjacent molecules. And here we see the, the uh, behavior is rather erratic where some principal components are either shielded or deshielded depending on the size of the cluster. And this indicates that you really do need this full cluster consisting of the first coordination shell, specifically of 15 molecules to account for intermolecular effects properly. So taking these insights from both molecular solids and network solids, we looked at a, um, a series of 16 materials which have uh, well-established platinum chemical shift tensors available in the literature. And we perform these calculations in four different ways. In the first case, uh, we see uh, GPAW calculations. Next to it in red, these are calculations on a cluster of molecules uh, using the PVE functional and scalar relativistic approximations. So this is the closest approximation you can get to the GPAW calculations. Then in green, uh, we, we're still using the PVE functional, uh, but here we've increased the relativistic treatment up to the spin orbit level. And then in yellow, we switch from using the PVE functional to a hybrid functional such as PVE zero. The agreement with experiment uh, is given by these numbers. As I said earlier, ideally the slope of this correlation line should be as close as possible to minus one. And the RMS error should be as close to zero as possible. So in the case of the two scalar calculations, we find that the slope is slightly off from minus one, and they have uh, they feature errors in the order of 500 to 650 ppm, which corresponds to roughly 3.6% to 4.8% of the platinum chemical shift scale, which here is about 16,000 ppm. Interestingly, um, Use of uh, the spin orbit approximation on its own with, without a hybrid functional results in actually larger errors than we see with just the scalar approximation. So it is only in the final panel where we combine uh, the Zora spin orbit approximation with a hybrid functional that we can achieve the best agreement with experiment. So now that we've established what methods work best, we need to consider the fact that these uh, scale very poorly. So if we normalize a calculation on something uh, performed at the, uh, at the scalar level with a standard GG uh, uh, functional, we'll see that in, um, increasing the level of theory up to the spin orbit level will take approximately 100 times longer for the calculation to run. And then using a spin orbit approximation with a hybrid functional 
can take about a thousand times longer to run. That means uh, in cases where your calculations take minutes to hours at the very low level, at the PBE zero SO level, these can take days or potentially even weeks. So now that we've established that we have accurate computational protocols for Platinum 195, we want to expand our survey of the Platinum group elements. And the next logical target would be Rhodium 103. Now, in the literature, there is one major application of Rhodium NMR, as we could see here by Phillips et al. And the, these patterns were acquired over the course of many hours to well over a day in order to treat, uh, to acquire rather narrow patterns. So before we can explore these um, systems computationally, we had to first develop a method to uh, acquire experimental patterns efficiently. And here you can see six examples from our recent work in chemical science. So not to go into any detail on these, but we now have a method that allows us to uh, robustly acquire uh, ultra wide line ready 103 patterns with unprecedented uh, signal to noise and uniformity. We then applied the same computational approaches in order to predict the magnetic shielding tensors of these six materials. So again, this would be GPA calculations in blue, in red PBE scalar calculations, in green PBE spin orbit, and in yellow, uh, hybrid PBE zero spin orbit. And just as was the case with platinum, the best agreement with the experiment is only possible when using the most expensive computational approach. And we can see this through uh, the deviation of the slope from minus one, especially in the, the PBE zero, uh, sorry, the PBE SO case, and the uh, RMS errors, which are greatly minimized to 150 ppm in the final case. So now that we have some confidence that we can predict, that we can measure these patterns and then predict the uh, rhodium magnetic shielding tensors accurately, we can then use natural localized molecular orbital uh, calculations in order to interpret bonding in these systems. So it, I won't go into much detail on this, but if you're interested, this, this is uh, outlined for all these materials in the paper. But the, the bottom line is that we can interpret the observed magnetic shielding tensor, but the isotropic shift and the span of the chemical shift tensor in, ter in terms of contributions from individual orbitals. And the orbitals that most influence uh, the appearance of the pattern and which differ between molecule to molecule are the uh, rhodium 4D states and the rhodium ligand bonding orbitals. So this means we now have a pathway in order to interpret uh, bonding in the platinum group elements and potentially apply this to finding uh, replacement materials. We are also expanding into looking at um, multinuclear NMR studies of ligand atoms. So this is one example of uh, a rhodium dimer uh, with chlorine bridging atoms and organic ligands. And we were able to acquire uh, the chlorine spectra, the chlorine spectrum, and the carbon spectrum. So from the former, we're able to acquire, uh, up obtain the chlorine EFG tensor, from the latter, the carbon chemical shift tensor. And this provides a nice complementary pathway for examining uh, bonding in these platinum group uh, complexes, possibly uh, combined with NLMO. Uh, calculations in order to uh, predict, uh, interpret the, um, the spectra in terms of bonding. However, of the ligand atoms available to us in the literature, there is currently a, a very large um, set of uh, measurements of phosphorus-31 chemical shift tensors, specifically materials in which phosphorus serves as a ligand with a platinum-4 species. And so we have calculations here on eight different systems. Uh, again, but performed uh, in four different methods, uh, the same as before. So the first two uh, blue and red panels are performed at the scale level. And you can see the, the amount of scatter in these plots is terrible. However, in the bottom two panels, uh, we see that once you introduce spin orbit effects, 
you get far better agreement with experiment. And this gives us some confidence going into the future that we can use the combination of the metal NMR and the ligand NMR in order to uh, verify that our calculations properly describe the electronic structures of the system and then use NLMO uh, analysis in order to determine the nature of the metal ligand bonding. Just to finally mention, we've also made some recent progress on ruthenium NMR, where we see these two patterns, uh, two sets of patterns acquired at 18.8 Tesla and 35.2 Tesla uh, for, for these ruthenium organometallic complexes. And this is exciting because ruthenium is the first example of a PGE that we've been able to acquire, which is a quadrupolar nucleus. So this gives us access to both the chemical shift tensor and the EFG tensor. So we can potentially get more information out of the uh, analysis of these ruthenium patterns than either the rhodium or the platinum. And then very quickly for this final subject, I want to mention the idea of establishing a database of accurate chemical shift tensor measurements. So uh, chemical shifts are probably the most important and widely used uh, parameter within NMR. But despite the significance uh, of these measurements, there is no uh, large database of chemical shift tensor parameters that are uh, readily available to researchers. I note that there are a number of review articles wh which provide uh, sets, for, sets of data from either individual nuclei or classes of material. But the largest um, database to date, or the largest comprehensive survey was by uh, Michael Duncan in his uh, book, Principal Components of Chemical Shift Tensors which was published uh, in 1997. But since that date, um, there has been no major progress. So as a first attempt towards this, uh, I've been looking at establishing a database of carbon-13 chemical shift tensors and, and also validating these measurements through complementary DFT calculations. And for inclusion in this database, I've considered the following criteria. First, that all of the uh, carbon sites are resolvable and unambiguously assignable, that there are accurate crystal structures available, and that none of the data show any complicating factors such as uh, disorder or a strong influence of molecular level motion that could impact your measurements. And this validation includes going through Duncan's compilation, which consists of hundreds of, of examples of uh, carbon chemical shift tensor measurements, and validating every single one of them through DFT calculations. In addition to that, I've looked at uh, numerous papers that have been published in the subsequent three decades since Duncan's paper. And here we see the results. So this plot uh, contains over 1,200 principal components of carbon chemical shift tensors. For these calculations, uh, crystal structures were obtained from the Cambridge database and uh, subjected to a plane wave DFT geometry optimization. Subsequently, clusters of molecules were built. And in ADF, the, sh uh, the shielding was calculated using the GPAW approach at the PBE0 level. And significantly, the average error between calculation and experiment is only 2.6 ppm, showing that this is actually a very robust database and can be used in all sorts of NMR crystallographic investigations in the future. Just as a quick plug, starting, starting last year in 2013, uh, 2023, excuse me, uh, MagLab began hosting uh, an NMR spectroscopy school for undergraduate students. And we were able to host three students, uh, allowing them to, to um, sit in lectures, uh, to participate in tours at the MagLab, uh, uh, participate in round panels. But significantly, they also participated in a week of research with us. And we found that having students run standard carbon uh, CPMAS experiments is uh, an excellent avenue for introducing undergraduate students to, to research for the first time. It's also a great opportunity for augmenting the existing database of carbon chemical shift tensors by targeting moieties that we've identified as being absent from the database. And significant. Based on the research from this past year, this has already resulted in a publication. So we see these slow CPMAS spectra for cytosine and uracil that were acquired by undergraduates last year. So we're very excited about this moving on.
And so that's where I would like to end for today. Uh, I would, of course, like to thank Professor Shurko and the rest of our group at FSU, uh, as well as our former students, uh, the MAGLAB summer school students or winter school students, and our collaborators at the University at Buffalo who participated in the PGE project, uh, specifically uh, Jochen Hauschbach and his group. And I, of course, would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and you for listening. Hey, fantastic. Thank you for uh, such a great talk. Um, and some really impressive and extensive results. So uh, please, everyone, uh, put your questions in the Q&A. We always already have a couple of questions to start off with. Uh, so more of a comment from um, Joseph Sondrika, who mentions the Abinet code is able to do, is a plane wave code that can include uh, spin orbit coupling. Is that something you have any experience with or know any comparisons between uh, that and, and uh, ADF? I was aware that this was now available. I haven't looked into it yet, but it's definitely something I'd be interested in in the future. Cool. Yeah, useful to know. Uh, yes. So then a question from um, Fred Perra, who uh, mentions that it looks like the uh, inclusion of Hartree Fock has more of an effect than uh, including the spin orbit coupling. So did you try PBE naught with uh, scalar relativistic? Yes, we've looked at that. It, it really seems like you need both to be present in the calculation in order to achieve the best agreement. So both the admixture of hartree fock exchange plus spin orbit terms in the Zora Hamiltonian. Okay. okay. Not an easy solution then to the computational cost. Uh, another question um, from Fred, uh, who mentions that the three PPM error on the on the tensor components is is really impressive and actually kind of smaller than the typical experimental error. Um, have you considered comparing the accuracy on higher accuracy data such as single crystal NMR um, to see if it's even better? Is you know is it limited by the experimental accuracy? Yes. So in the database I'm putting together, we, we do have many examples of single crystal data. Un unfortunately, um, uh, the single crystal data is limited to a handful of different types of chemical moieties. So this comparison is rather difficult to make. So it seems we get the, the, the best agreement um, when we're dealing with simple hydrocarbons or things that only contain oxygen, whereas if your material contains uh, nitrogen, you have the you can have the potential effects of residual dipolar coupling, which could increase the experimental uncertainty in your data. Okay. Uh, so, a question from uh, Afil, who um, thanks for the interesting talk, and um, asked about the comparison between um, GPOR and GIAO. Uh, specifically, uh, in terms of well, the, uh, I guess the accuracy. Oh, oh okay. Um, well, the the benefit of GPAW is that you inherently account for intermolecular interactions. GIAO, you can do this as well, but you have to include a, a large cluster of molecules. But really, if, if if you do everything else as similarly as possible, I've shown in previous work that you get essentially the same result out. Uh, however, when we're dealing with cases like these heavy atoms, the GIAO calculations do have the potential to give you better results, but at a higher computational cost. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then a question from Alir. Again, thank you for the talk. Um, how, how can you choose how many molecules you include in the uh, geometry optimization? Uh, as you uh, mentioned, kind of increasing the cluster size. Right. So in the geometry optimization, we, we perform these using a, a plane wave code. So it's a periodic calculation. So it, con it consists of uh, an infinitely repeated unit cell. Uh, the more interesting question is how you, how many molecules you, you choose for calculation of the shielding uh, with mm -hmm. ADF. And really, it, uh, a simple rule is to include the first coordination shell of molecules around your central molecule. If you skip any of those, it, it readily appears in calculations of heavy atoms. It will be less apparent in lighter atoms, uh, such as such as carbon, where the chemical shift range is limited. But in, mm -hmm. in the case of platinum, these intermolecular effects can be well over 1,000 ppm. So you can systematically increase the size of the cluster to see what is necessary. OK, great. And I guess there's no, uh, you can't sort of benchmark on, on you know, what sort of cutoff you need and then apply that to another system because that could have different intermolecular uh, interactions. 
it could, but in general, the, the first coordination shell is going to be sufficient. It could be overkill, but it, okay, yes, great. Uh, okay, so another question from um, Aidan Farrell, who asks: um, So obviously you reparameterized the D two and the TS dispersion. Um, did you consider newer corrections like D three, um, MBD, XDM? Pick your favorites. Yeah. We haven't yet, but this is something we're very interested in, D3 and D4 in particular. Okay, great. Uh, just another um, comment from Joseph uh, about the comparison of uh, GIO and GPO. Uh, so he says he doesn't think that uh, one is better or worse than, than the other. Um, it's more to do with uh, the difference for isolated species, so it's easier to compute the FOC matrix. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you can use the hybrid functionals, uh, which I think is you know similar to sort of your your comments on that as well. Uh, okay, so um, do, do keep any final questions coming in. I had a few questions. Um, you're changing the nuclear charge in your clusters. How did you pick that those numbers? So, the, the, in order to achieve achieve SCF convergence, you want the charge on the cluster to be as close to zero as possible. So uh, you, you just distribute this uh, charge around all of the, the peripheral nuclei by increasing their charges. And you increase the amount of charge by a different amount, depending on how many of the, the terminal bonds are missing. And uh, how, like, how do you know, is it directly proportional to the number of missing bonds? It, it's or... directly proportional to the number of missing bonds, unless the bond lengths are wildly different from one another, in which case you can introduce a more complicated model uh, based on say bond valence theory. Something that I've been struggling with a bit, so it's a useful trick to know. Yeah, um, yeah. So if the bond, yeah, if the bonds are very similar in length to one another, then you can just need to introduce a new charge that's proportional to the number of missing bonds. Okay, great. Uh, so you, you briefly showed the ruthenium um, data, which um, was yeah impressive data, and you mentioned that you can distinguish the CSA and the EFG. Um, have you? managed to do that just from the kind of the data at the two fields or is that still ongoing no you can easily um determine each of them unambiguously if you have data acquired at two fields okay and out of interest um what dominates is it the csa the fg i was trying to compare just kind of the widths at the two fields but this is an interesting case in which they're both uh, very important okay so yeah the, the chemical shift span is several thousand ppm in both cases so it, it really does have an impact so there is cool. narrowing at high field, but not as much as you would expect in a pure water polar yeah. pattern. Okay, great. A good a good system to have picked then. Um, I also had uh, a question about your your calculations in your database, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so you mentioned that you constructed clusters for each from each sort of geometry optimized structure. It, is that manual, or have you automated or semi automated that? So there's a lot of data points. <laughs> Yes. Uh, at this point, I generally do it manually just so I can check and make sure that there's mm -hmm. been no problem in the geometry optimization, but I think you could probably easily uh, automate this process. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, very impressive. <laughs> Must have taken a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, so I just pull up a question from Charlotte. Uh, so again, impressive work. She has another question. Can the simulations be used to create a database to deconvolute complex spectra, um, or, or if not, why not? So I guess if you if you knew the full tensor for anything that could reasonably be in your um, your sample, you could uh, effectively pattern match from your database. Is that oh, something that's just possible? Uh, presumably, if the database is large enough. Okay, possibly, yeah, not not there yet. But, uh, I guess a related question, is there a plan to uh, publish this database in, in sort of a, a form that can be accessed by the community? That is ultimately the goal. We're, we're looking yeah. into ways uh, of um, making a web interface so this can be really accessible and, and, and searched, most importantly. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm sure, yeah, we very much appreciate it. Uh, so another question from Fred, 
um, who mentions for EFGs, you can do what's called um, AVOLD summation to include long range electrostatic interactions for a, a small cluster. Is that something um, that could work for shielding as well? Do you think? I, I believe that has been done before. Uh, for example, by, by the grant group, if I'm not mistaken. I think it generally yields similar accuracies to uh, these cluster models, but I, I would have to do a direct comparison of the same sets of, of materials. Okay, great. Uh, a practical question from Alia. What software are you using to um, extract the, the EFGs? Um, uh, or in fact, the other way around, when you have your EFG, how are you simulating the spectrum? Uh, generally just W solids or snake or anything like that. Okay. And what, any favorite package, what would you recommend? I generally ju would just use W solids because it, it's straightforward and there's very good documentation specifically related to, to things like the uh, convention for reporting the Euler angles. Yep. Yeah. Obviously a big problem. Uh, okay. So a question from uh, Ron Abdiswas who asks, is there a plan to adapt ADF? Um, yeah. So is there a the plan to include Zora in, in periodic systems? I guess is the question. So we heard about Avenet earlier. I thought yeah. I heard that Clustep was also planning to implement, or maybe already has. Um, uh, Zora they have a, a scalar uh, Zora approximation available in Cast. Okay, but it's the spin orbit level that's um, that's necessary here. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, and again, a comment from Joseph that Zora exists in um, uh, Vine two K and in Abinet. Um, but again, I don't know whether that's to the, the spin orbit level or just the um, scalar or specific. But those um, are definitely things I would like to explore in the future. Uh, so I guess any final questions? Um, okay, apparently yes to the spin orbit level. Interesting. Uh, thanks, Good Joseph, for that clarification. Um, so any final questions? And then one more from me. Uh, so I just noticed that when you're showing the calculated um, values you included to the sign of the CQ, um, is there any scope to experimentally accessing the sign um, of the CQ? Uh, not with any of these single resonance experiments that I've been showing you. Uh, for these, the, pa the pattern is only influenced by the magnitude of CQ. Okay, and is, would there be any benefit if we could get to the sign? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there would be because the sign, especially in uh, chloride ions, the sign of CQ varies systematically depending on the types of, of, the, of the arrangements of the hydrogen bonds around the chlorine site. So in principle, yes, that would be very helpful to have as well. 